Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Laura Prada from the Telesur Studios in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with the news. Stay with us. The Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has said that there is no support for military intervention in Venezuela. Lavrov made their remarks after a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and the two are in Finland for the meeting of the Arctic countries. The Russian Foreign Minister added that he doesn't believe there is support for military actions in Venezuela within the United States. During my contacts with my U.S., European and South American colleagues, I did not see any support for a reckless military solution in Venezuela. I hope this overall understanding will be put into practice and there will be no military solution because it would be catastrophic. Yeah, I don't want to say too much other than I made clear our view that the Venezuelans deserve a democracy that is, doesn't have any foreign party running their country or involved in their country uh, on a consistent basis in a military way, right? So we want the Cubans out, we want the Iranians out, Russians military out. We, we've we had that conversation and we uh, started to talk about how our interests uh, might be able to find a way forward. I don't know that we'll get to the right place, um, but we'll have further conversations. Meanwhile, Venezuela's Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza has confirmed there is a group of Russian military experts in his country. The group aims at further deepening cooperation between the two countries, especially regarding military technology. Arreaza has also set plans to move the offices of a state-owned oil company, PDVSA, from Portugal to Russia are underway. The move hasn't been finalized yet, but Arreaza said the company continues to function smoothly and will participate in an upcoming international forum on oil production. We did hope that Russia would import more oil from Venezuela, but what we did hope for is to see Russia produce oil with Venezuela. We hope Russia will invest more in our different companies. We have a joint company that can produce more, and we are confident that Russia will have all the necessary resources to invest more in the oil sector in Venezuela, and that this oil will benefit both countries, that the profits of this are shared. We are sure this will happen. Now we move on. We go to Bolivia because an official report reveals that the country no longer occupies the last place in terms of minimum wage in the American continent. Let's find out more about the country's continued economic growth on the following story. In 2019, the minimum wage increased by just 3 percent as one of the minor readjustments in 13 years of the current administration. But the amount reveals the steady economic growth that the country has enjoyed. In 2005, Bolivia was the country that had the lowest minimum national wage in the region, at just $54 a month, or 440 bolivianos. Today, minimum wage stands at 2.1 bolivianos, which equals $305. As such, we have surpassed the minimum wages of Brazil, Colombia, Peru, and Argentina. In the time of neoliberal government, wages were frozen for years at a time. With the current administration, every year salaries are readjusted in relation to past inflation figures. At the moment, we stand in the middle of the chart. Chile is still at the top, with a minimum wage of $452. They are followed by Uruguay at $445, Ecuador with $394, and Paraguay with $341. We stand very close to Paraguay. The annual readjustment of wages is done following negotiations with labor unions. It's true. Every year we have been increasing wages, doing what we can to help workers. These agreements are based on a request presented by labor unions to the government. We not only discuss the wage issue, but we have said that we need to strengthen national companies like Yacimientos, Ende and Ente. We are even reevaluating our lithium reserves, and we are asking to develop iron ore in Mutun. President Evo Morales says he governs along with social organizations and unions, to which he has assigned the role of a social cabinet and with whose representatives he met at least once a month. 
I'm from Bolivia. We go to Mexico where two members of the indigenous communities were murdered on Thursday while they were inside a truck in the state of Guerrero. According to a local newspaper, Jose Lucio Bartolo Faustino and Modesto Verales Sebastian were members of the National Indigenous Congress. The leaders were reported missing on Saturday after they went to a meeting in, Chilpa, in Chilpancingo with members of the Guerrero Popular and Indigenous Council. In an official communique, the indigenous movement said they have been organizing community policing for years to resist the violent extortion and imposition of poppy sowing by two criminal groups who control the municipal presidencies of the region. And in Colombia, social leader Francia Marquez was attacked on Saturday afternoon. She, along with other human rights defenders, were attacked with grenades by unknown assaultants while preparing a work agenda with the national government. Our correspondent in Bogotá, Tatiana Portela, sent us the following report with more details. After the attempt on the life of Francia Marquez, there have been a lot of reactions. There has been a rejection of the violence from some Colombian media outlets, some political leaders and some opposition figures who are all worried about the murder of social leaders. But Francia Marquez means as a leader is very well known. She has already won two prizes for the defense of territories and life. The demonstration is related to the large number of murders of social leaders in the Cauca department. Let's remember the social and popular Minga. Protesters are against President Ivan Duque's government, his lack of policies and the guarantees for the protection of social leaders, as was part of the peace agreement which has not been adhered to by the administration. The Duque government has proposed an attention plan which is not a real public policy and it doesn't guarantee the integral protection of the lives of social leaders. The plan has been rejected as it means further militarization and also lacks the support of the communities affected by these murders. Thank you, Tatiana. I'm from Colombia. We go to Brazil where hundreds of students and teachers have protested in the streets against the budget cuts in public education. They rallied outside a military high school in Rio de Janeiro where President Jair Bolsonaro was attending a ceremony. The protesters denounced that 30% cuts in public funds for federal education institutions, which were announced by the government last week. The students carried out banners that said, quote, Education is not an expense, but an investment. This government has been repeatedly attacking education by cutting funding in sociology, philosophy, and now it's attacking the federal institution that produced 95% of university studies that come out of Brazil. This government is promoting a complete dismantling of the country. All that's been built up to now is being destroyed, and it's going to take many years to rebuild everything. So we are here against the dismantling, against this government, and against the cuts in education, science, and technology. And now we go to a first break here. And from the South, make sure you follow us on Twitter at Tell Us Your English and on my account at Laura Pitelesser. Stay with us. And we begin in the Caribbean, U.S. President Donald Trump heavily criticized Democrats on Monday for the standoff of our disaster relief bill, saying that Puerto Rico has already received too much assistance. Democrats refused to support the legislation because they believe it does not include enough funds 
for the Commonwealth territory which was devastated by Hurricane Maria in September 2017. Trump said he does not want to approve an aid package for Puerto Rico that includes more than $600 million for food aid. And Cuba has ratified its commitment to the Association of Caribbean States. Foreign Minister um, Bruno Rodriguez said, uh, with, met with ACS EAEC Secretary General June Summer in Havana on Tuesday. Rodriguez took to Twitter to, during the meeting to reaffirm Cuba's support for the ongoing revitalization process of the regional relations. And CARICOM plans to go to the Inter-American Development Bank to purchase resources for the region's security, architecture and assets. CARICOM's chairman made the announcement at the end of the 19th special meeting of CARICOM heads in Trinidad. For the widest range of security assistance to be provided to any requesting member state within CARICOM. And we continue in Trinidad and Tobago because former Attorney General and an opposition senator have both appeared in court in corruption case charges. And then Ram Logan and Gerald Ramdim were read the charges arising out of an alleged fee kickback scam at the AG's office. The scam allegedly took place while Ram Logan held the position from 2010 to 2015. The two men were not called upon to enter a plea. The cases were adjourned until June 28th. Now, hear this. Venezuela is not the only country that the United States seeks to intimidate. Washington's National Security Advisor John Bolton has released a statement saying that the U.S. is deploying an aircraft carrier to send a message to Iran. The document quotes troubling warnings but fails to clarify this any further. Many analysts have said it is unlikely that how the White House took the decision to send the aircraft carrier to the region over the past weekend. An official Navy statement said the Abraham Lincoln Strike Group left its station for a regular deployment on April 1st. Instead, the journey will have been planned well in advance. However, the escalation of rhetoric raises concerns for peace in the region. Turkey's electoral authorities have ordered a new election for Istanbul's major. Ekrem Imamoglu of the main opposition Republican People's Party was declared major on April 17th, but President Recep Tayyip Erdogan party locked an objection and asked for a new election alleging voting irregularities. New elections board members have accepted the party's objection with seven votes in favor and four against. The new vote will be held on June 23rd. The United Nations and the African Union have jointly presided over the third African Union United Nations annual conference this Monday. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres and African Union Chairman Moussa Faki Mohamed are expected to disclose the outcome of the debate. The United Nations Secretary General spokesperson revealed that there is a deep association and many shared objectives between the two organizations. And the month of Ramadan fasting has begun for millions of Muslims around the world. For the entire holy month, Muslims have, will be abstaining from food and drink between dawn and dusk. They are also encouraged to focus on meditative acts like prayer, reading the Quran and charity. However, millions more in India, Pakistan and Iran will likely be marking the start of the lunar month on Tuesday based on moon sightings in the region. The end of Ramadan is met with a holiday called Eid al-Fitr, and so we say Ramadan Mubarak to our Muslim brothers and sisters across the world. In Egypt, archaeologists have unveiled part of an ancient cemetery near the pyramids of Giza outside Cairo. Officials from the Ministry of Antiques said the cemetery is believed to be 4,500 years old. 
The cemetery houses burial shafts, tombs of top officials and a fine limestone statue from the Old Kingdom's 5th dynasty. Time for a second and a very short break. Stay tuned. We are back. Journalists in Libya have protested in Tripoli against the abduction of their colleagues. The journalists hold placards and marching out in the streets demanding the release of Mohamed al kurih and Mohamed al shabani who work for Libya's al Ahrar TV. The two journalists were covering clashes near Tripoli for a private TV channel and were detained by a group loyal to Khalifa Haftar on Thursday. Their fate remains unknown. We are protesting today to support our colleagues Mohamed al kirid and Mohamed al shabani who were abducted last Thursday. We don't have any news about them or what's become of them. We hope that the organizations who abduct them will free them. At least 58 people have been killed in Niger when a fuel tanker exploded near the international airport in the capital Niamey. Health officials said 40 people have sustained injuries and are hospitalized. According to witnesses, the victims were trying to collect fuel leaking from the truck after it overturned on railway tracks. An international criminal court has announced that Jordan will not be referred to a United Nations Security Council for failing to arrest former Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir for war crimes. The split decision by the five-judge panel reverses a previous decision by the ICC. But the court has upheld a reprimand on Jordan for not arresting Bashir in 2017 when he attended an Arab League summit. This despite there being two international guards for the outset Sudanese president arrest. Bashir has traveled to a number of countries over the past decade without being arrested. Still in Sudan, ruling Transitional Military Council said it will issue its own constitutional draft after disagreeing with some points in the position proposal. A revised constitution is part of negotiated efforts to form a joint military civilian council before elections, but protesters are skeptical. They say as time goes by, the military council is becoming increasingly powerful, adding that this threatens the definitive transfer of power to the civil sector. In South Africa, election week has kicked off. On Monday, the country's electoral commission conducted special votes ahead of the main voting day on Wednesday. The early, the, early, the sick and all those who won't be able to vote on the official voting day cast their ballots. Let's find out more on the following story. The country's biggest political players have wrapped up their campaigns. It's been 25 years of independence from the white minority apartheid rule. And now South Africans are judging the governing ANC party on its gains in the last two and a half decades. Party leader Cyril Ramaphosa has urged voters to forgive the party for its mistakes and give it another chance. This is a moment where we must choose to return to a past of conflict and anger, of corruption and also hunger. Or we can choose 
to embark on a path of renewal and go forward. The second biggest party in the country, the Democratic Alliance, is convinced it will increase its electoral support after a campaign that poked holes in the ANC's 25 years in power. This is our moment to step out of our comfort zone. We're going to look to the future now. And on Wednesday, we're going to make a brave choice on Wednesday. We want to think about our children when we vote on Wednesday. But above all, we're going to be brave and brave for our people. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy, but I'm telling you it's going to be worth it. There's also the game changer in South African politics. The Economic Freedom Fighters is a splinter group of the ANC and has become a force to be reckoned with in the short time since its establishment in 2013. We are not fighting against whites. We are fighting to sit on the dinner table. White people, you will no longer eat alone. We are coming to sit on the dinner table and if you are refusing us on a dinner table we are going to destroy that dinner table no one is going to eat until all of us in south africa eat from the same dinner table south africans have more than 40 parties to choose from in this year's election Political analysts believe the big parties may lose support to the smaller, newer parties. With many voters still undecided according to polls, it remains to be seen if traditional voting patterns will change. Matiwa Masachi, Telesur in Johannesburg. And from South Africa, we go to Palestine in the Gaza Strip, or starting the holy months of Ramadan on a somber note after Israeli strikes killed at least 24 people. The strikes have also caused extensive damage to dozens of residential buildings, leaving hundreds of families homeless. Israeli warplanes bombed more than 20 hundred sites across the Gaza Strip since late on Saturday. Of course, because of the siege for many years, the economic situation of the people is bad. The political situation is not good. Ramadan arrives during a tough situation for people. The people are suffering without this fight. The war environment made the situation worse and increased the suffering of the people. The situation for all is very bad and it's not the atmosphere of Ramadan. There are no celebrations, no preparations. There is nothing that shows that it is Ramadan. And the Palestinian Prime Minister has condemned continuous Israeli strikes on the Gaza Strip. The government calls on the United Nations to intervene immediately to stop the aggression and prevent its possible renewal and to provide international protection for our people in the Gaza Strip. The government says that the international community cannot be silent against the crimes of the Israeli occupation against civilians. At least 26 fighters have been killed in Syria after government forces carry out airstrikes in northern Hama on Monday. According to authorities, 15 government fighters were among those killed in fierce fighting. The fighting came as regime forces advanced on two villages and a strategic helicopter on the region. Authorities say it's in response to stepped-up attacks by the rebel army on government's health areas, denying that the strikes were indiscriminate. Like this, we come to the end of this news preview. You can find this and much more stories on our website, www.telesurenglish.net, where, of course, you can read opinion articles, watch special interviews, and follow all the material we produce especially for you. Continue with Telesur, connecting the global thousands. Until next time, thank you for watching.